as if it wasn't bad enough that Baylor got blown out by Iowa State. Come to find out, Iowa State didn't even need to take it out of second gear when beating the Bears by three touchdowns. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Bears fans. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Baylor, brought to you by FanDuel and part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every day. I'm your host, Cam Stewart of ESPN Central Texas and The Cam Show on Rogue Media Sports Network and The Cam Show on YouTube. Appreciate y'all joining in once again. Appreciate you making it your first listen today and every day. I know there's so many everydayers out there who are just so locked on Baylor that it hurts. But I appreciate you guys, and we'll get through this hurt together. Uh, but today we're talking about the insult to injury that uh, that Iowa State added to Baylor a few days after uh, that blowout loss for the Bears in Ames. Plus, a look at this Super League, this Operation Rudy, Project Rudy, going around college football. And it's one that Baylor has seen. Baylor is one of the few athletic departments in the nation that has seen this proposal for a Super League in college football. We'll go over where that would leave the Bears. Plus... If we are talking about looking for a new football coach, which I think is something that Mac Rhodes will also have to look at, is the price a little higher than it would be most years? We'll take a look at that and why that is going to be the case. All that and more coming up on this episode of Locked on Baylor. We remember, it wasn't that long ago, we remember the the smarting loss uh, at Iowa State over the weekend, 43-21. The Cyclones take out the Bears and scored 40 of the last 47 points of the game after Baylor was up 14-3. to And look, I mean, any, any of those of you watched it or have followed along the show the last few days, you know that was, that was a tough one. Baylor was not the better team, and it was going to take quite a Herculean effort to go and beat Iowa State in Ames and what it turned out to be was a blowout after such a promising start. It, it just felt like another, you know, hit on the head, basically. Like, we are the we are the moles that are getting whacked week after week uh, watching Baylor football. But to add insult to injury, a video came out yesterday of um, the, the Iowa State offensive coordinator, who they love down there, Taylor Mauser, um, with, a, with a message to his team at halftime that cannot make – the Baylor players, coaches, fans, anyone associated with the team feel good. Got no answers for any of our stuff. We've got a couple little couple little blitz that'll set us back and we go right back down the field again. Okay, so you gotta have a next play mentality the whole second half. And we're gonna come down there, we're gonna throw it down the field. Right? There's so much stuff on here we haven't even got to. There's so much stuff we haven't even gotten to. And they didn't need to get to it to get to 43 points and and blow out the Bears. Um, it, it was obviously not a good scene for Baylor, and that just kind of makes it feel worse. Obviously, I, obviously, that's not like trash talk. That's a, that's a coach talking to his players and, and giving them encouragement. But, I mean, he kind of hit it on the head. They have no answers for this. Iowa State didn't pull out anything that they didn't, you know, didn't use against Arkansas State or North Dakota. It just went right down the field. I mean, you heard him. We're just going to throw the ball down the field. Basically telling his guys they can't cover us. And by the results of the game, you saw Taylor Mauser was 100% correct. They they could not cover these Iowa State uh, receivers. They almost had two guys go over 100 yards. Jalen Noll finishes at 98. Uh, but obviously Higgins had the big game for eight catches and, and 116. I mean, you look at the numbers for Rocco Back. Again, it wasn't earth shattering 16 and 25 277 yards two touchdowns and a pick and his team won by three touchdowns in a conference game you know you, you didn't even really need to make them work for it um and jackson was huge out of the backfield um for a team that was kind of middle of the pack running the football in the big 12 not not bad not great uh that last touchdown he had i think devin gardner actually pointed this out on the broadcast if if it had been two hand touch he still would have scored a touchdown from what it was like 21 yards out or something. One Baylor Bear got one hand on him, and that was it. So, of course, they didn't need to go into their bag. 
it was it was like horrific. It was, you know, they they didn't even take it out of second gear. It was easy nine to five or easy nine to five cooking, hands at 10 and two, get the car in the garage. And that's exactly what they did in this game. In fact, they threw away some points. They had a turnover on downs inside the red zone. They had a pick at the five yard line. You know, they, they threw away points in that game and still scored 43 and didn't punt the whole game on Dave Aranda's defense. Yes, that is Dave Aranda's defense, which looked so promising a few weeks ago. Ah, maybe a blip here and there, but now it's it's 30 straight, or excuse me, 30 plus and three straight games. Not not to 30 straight games yet, but who knows? Um, and they and Iowa State held the ball for basically 36 minutes. Third straight week that Iowa State held the ball for at least 35 minutes. So you you know that that's kind of their MO, but what that tells me is you look at the, the two weeks before that, they faced Houston, who some of us thought were going to be the was going to be the worst team in the Big 12. That doesn't seem to be the case. Not that not that good, but not the worst. Houston and Arkansas State. They did the same things to those teams that they did to Baylor. What what is differentiating Baylor from those teams at this point? They look like a bottom of the conference team and one that could that looks like a group of five teams sometimes. That's what Iowa State's offense did to them. And 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 there was some hype around Iowa State's offense coming into the season, but I think even the Cyclones fans will tell you it's not like great. You know, they're middle of the pack in basically all the categories in the Big 12. Um, but they've got a they've got a quarterback who makes good decisions. Uh might need to work on getting it out of bounds a little bit better. Um, they've got a running back who played a really nice game, and they have two veteran receivers that that lit up Baylor. And so they're they're probably not going to make too many mistakes, but I wouldn't call this like an earth-shattering offense, and yet they certainly looked like that. Or held a three in the first quarter, and then bang, 16, 14, 10, game over. Over. Way over. And they kind of take the gas pedal. They take the foot off the gas pedal. There you go. And keep it at just 43 points. But you take away those two, those two possessions inside the red zone where they don't score. You're talking 50 plus, almost 60 points. By the way, their last field goal, I think, came uh, from the, the line of scrimmage was in the red zone too. That's almost 60 points in a conference game that, that could have easily flipped that way. Of course they didn't need to go deep in the playbook. But yeah, that, that kind of sucks to go on social media and see that. That like, oh, yeah. No, we saw how bad it was. And now we've got a coach telling us just how bad it was. Like they had no answers for the Cyclones. And Iowa State just kind of cruised along the whole game For, down 14 to three. They didn't, they didn't panic. They didn't try to change anything. They just got their looks the whole rest of the game. and didn't have to punt. Dave Aranda's defense, um, which could affect Baylor in terms of what tier they go into in the super league. What's the super league you're asking? Well, it's actually called project Rudy. And we're going to go over exactly what that is coming up after this word from game time. As you well know, game time is the only place I go and buy my tickets. In fact, I'm already checking Baylor basketball tickets right there because I can go in and I could toggle the all-in pricing feature, which means that price that I see when I see the tickets and the seats, that's the price I'm going to pay. No hidden fees. And oh, yeah, I can see the view from my seats before I hit purchase too. And I've got the lowest price guarantee where game time is going to credit me or you 110% of the difference. And the purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So if you like all the hassle of going and buying tickets from some of these other websites, go ahead, be my guest. I don't like that. I personally don't like hassle. There's enough hassle in my life, and I'm sure yours too. So let's take the guesswork out of buying tickets, and let's go to Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code Locked On C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off, and then go download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. And it might well be game time for a very new look in college football. We've heard proposals of this before, and we've obviously seen the, 
this coming with with conference realignment and and everything else that comes with it obviously college football is driven by money right like we're not surprising anyone here no one's grasping their pearls hearing that and there's been a taste in the last few years of more money real lucrative money and that's not going to stop things like media rights NIL collectives all those things kind of go to the greater picture of how money is driving college football. And Ross Dellinger came out with a report yesterday about this project Rudy and what this could mean for college football. And it's a long read, but it's very interesting. Um, Obviously, Ross is absolutely one of the best in the business. Uh, So I'm going to go over what I can, what I've gathered here from the Ross Dellinger article on what this is going to look like. I actually came to you with an episode in the spring. Um, Some of you might have tuned out. It was after basketball season. I can't blame you too much. Um, And it was was a similar proposal. It was 70 teams in, in, in a kind of tier one. It was going to be all the power four teams plus... Um, the best group of five teams. And I think it was seven divisions of 10 or 10 divisions of seven. And there were some that could get um, promoted, but the power four teams couldn't get relegated. It it was odd. Um, I get what they were going for, but it was odd. We've seen this similarly if you follow European soccer. Um, If you're into that, you've actually seen a, a similar type of proposal. But now there are these... Disney executives, former Disney executives, turned investment professionals calling this project Rudy, naming it after Rudy Rudiger, which I think is hilarious because obviously if you've seen the movie Rudy or know the story, that dude, however however real that story is, was really truly in it for the love of the game and the love of Notre Dame. And this is about the love of money. It's the antithesis of Rudy. I think there's a good little irony in there um, about what that's what, what that signifies. Uh, 14 slide presentation that has been shown to only a select number of athletic departments uh, around the country. In fact, we do have uh, some of the ones that it was shown to. Okay. Um, it has been shared, it covers the country's richest football powers, and then some. Florida State, Georgia, Miami, LSU, Alabama, Clemson, Penn State, Auburn, Oregon, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Texas, USC, Michigan, Florida, Iowa State, Arizona, and Baylor. Mac Rhodes has seen the presentation. There are plenty of others in college football who have not. There are some, there are some blue bloods who are left off that list, but not Baylor. Baylor has seen that. TCU has not seen that. Tech has not seen that. Uh, Oklahoma has not seen that. Oklahoma State has not seen that. Baylor has. Boy, that's interesting. Mac Rhodes on the cutting edge of this. Could this be something that Baylor wants to be involved in? It's an interesting structure. What it's trying to do is make the big brands happy, as as you're going to see with any proposal going forward, by the way. Uh, make the rich richer in a sense because it's an unequal um, pay landscape in terms of of uh, revenue sharing. But before we get to that, the the way it looks out for the integrity of college football, as it were, plus the big brands, is this is a structure that is going to keep the conferences intact, specifically those power four conferences, right? The Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, ACC. Those are going to keep intact. What they're going to do is prioritize big-time games, and what they're essentially going to try to eliminate is FCS teams and a lot of group of five teams playing power four teams. They want to keep the rivalries. They want to keep the Blue Bloods playing each other, keep the conference matchups, but take away some of those ones that aren't money makers. They're tune-ups for teams, but not necessarily money makers and then find some matchups in there for blue bloods or or geographical games to make sure that they they keep big big teams playing against big teams. So what that could mean for Baylor would be something like, you know, they're not playing Tarleton anymore or maybe not as many games against an Air Force or a Texas State. What they will face is someone like AM or UT or Missouri or Nebraska, or someone like that. And so for the college football fan perspective, I think we we like that. 
you know, obviously being in the position of being a fan of a power four team really, really helps that, you know, Texas state, here they are on the rise and looking to get a seat at the table. And all of a sudden they're not going to have the opportunity as much to, to play schools like Baylor or tech or TCU once they fancy their chances against in years like this year and, and last year. Or how about UNLV, who's taken the, the group of five by storm? You know, they've beaten a couple of Big 12 teams this year. Arizona State, Kansas. They're like, are you going to take those games off our schedule? Probably. Probably in, in this scenario. And this is it's a long, it's a long read, by the way. So there's a lot to go over with it. But what it comes down to as well is not only trying to keep those. Okay, so I'm going to try to put it in Ross Dellinger's terms. They're going to try to arrange more games between power conference programs by eliminating all games against group of five and SCS opponents, expanding the playoffs, and pitting blue blood powers more often against one another. So more Michigan, Texas, and less Texas UTSA. Uh, consolidate the media rights of the 70 schools under one agreement instead of the current structure of five different packages, one for each league and then uh, obviously Notre Dame. And there comes in a relegation piece as well, but that comes with the tiers, which is the next big part of it. There are basically three tiers in this project, Rudy. Okay, uh, It separates the 70 programs into these three. Tier one, the top 16 schools earn per school revenue projections from 130 million in year four, escalated to 250 million in year 12. And just to put some context to those numbers, that year 12 is double the SEC and Big Ten's current distribution rate, which are the two biggest, obviously, by far. And then you look at tier two. The next 22 schools earn a revenue of somewhere between 60 and 110 million, which is similar to the SEC and Big Ten current rates. In fact, a good year for a school like uh, Bay or, or TCU or Tech puts them at the high end of that, over 100 million and into 110. When we looked at the last proposal, it was circling that 110 number in terms of the teams who could stay in the top tier. That was yearly athletics revenue. This would be part of the revenue sharing. And then tier three, the last 32 schools earn projections of about 30 to 60 million, which is similar to what we're at right now in the Big 12, the Big 12 and the ACC rates. In fact, I think this year it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 million. Uh, but the model offered, this is where it gets really important. The model, the model offers a variety of ways to determine how to tier schools. Things like the previous season's results, perhaps, or an aggregate of results over a stretch of seasons. The model also features a relegation and promotion system to pave a way for schools to move up and down the tiers. We don't know the specifics of that. However, one proposed model suggests having eight permanent members of Tier 1, a move presumably presumably to placate the biggest brands in the sport. Now, that's that's obvious, right? They're going to Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, Notre Dame, USC. They're always going to be in that tier. Texas, Oklahoma, they're going to try like hell to make sure they are always in that tier. The same way right now, the SEC and the Big Ten are asking for more guaranteed spots in the 12 team playoff and hopefully trying to expand it to 14 or 16 so they can get more of their teams in there. Ugh, that's annoying. But what the kicker is for me as a Baylor fan in there is the fact that it is now looking at performance-based uh, relegation promotion, not revenue the way we heard about in the last big projection in the spring. Because there was this thing where it was, you know, if you're over 100 or 105 or 110 million, you would stay in that top tier. In the other proposal we saw from a different uh conglomerate a few months ago and that was going to be really tough for Baylor to sustain year in year out Baylor Tech TCU Oklahoma State these teams that are that are mainstays in the Big 12 and, and obviously you know Utah Colorado schools like that too where if you have a bad year you're probably under that number but now what it's going to show you in, in this model in Project Rudy is yeah, well, if you have a bad year, you're you're counting your days anyway. And so you look at Baylor the last couple of years, let's say they stretch it to three seasons. Oh, no. Baylor could be screwed with this year, last year, and the year before. Like, that could, that could put them in Tier 3. Like, they've been that bad. It, this could be three straight losing seasons. So if this does come into the, into the college football landscape in the next few years, 
You've got to worry about what soccer teams have to worry about in England. When you drop down a tier, can you make the revenue to sustain yourself? Can you make the revenue to get back up, to earn that promotion? Because even if you're in tier three, you're playing teams from tier one. You're still in the big 12. So if Utah or BYU or Oklahoma State or Tech is in tier one because they've had a good couple of years, you're still playing those teams. And, the, you know, there's not a lot of Tier 3 teams that are going to be in the Big 12. It's going to be the same problem you face right now, but with humongous financial ramifications. I, it's a better proposal, I think, than what it was in the spring from a different group. But it does not suit Baylor very well. It might suit college football better, but it might be like a, a line in the sand for Baylor of like, Hey, you got to turn this thing around now because something like this could be on the cards in, in, in a few years and you won't be able to keep up. You won't be able to compete because if you're in tier three, you're down in the bottom in terms of the revenue you're going to get. And you've got to find someone, a coach or somebody, a player who can turn your butts around without spending a ton of money because you don't have the money. Now, all of a sudden, it'll be a power dynamic within the conferences. It's not going to be equal pay throughout the conferences. We already knew there was a power dynamic problem anyway with Texas and OU in the Big 12 for years versus all these other schools. But now you add in the fact that Kansas State could have a good couple of years and they're making double or triple what you are in revenue as you try to move back up. Ah, uh, man. A penny for the thoughts of Mac Rhodes on that one. To be a fly on the wall in that meeting to hear what Mac Rhodes is thinking about what that could do for college football and what that could mean for his program. Hooey. Mac Rhodes has some other issues to deal with right now. And speaking of money, that price might be going well up. We'll talk about that coming up on Locked on Baylor. Today's episode of Locked on Baylor is brought to you by FanDuel. I'm talking to you, the NFL fan. You can start this season with a big return on FanDuel, which is, of course, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Let me say that again. You're going to get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet on FanDuel.com. Once again, that is FanDuel.com. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, I got to talk coaching thing again. I do, because I, I, I heard a great point um, from two of my Locked On colleagues, actually, Parker Ainsworth of, of Locked On Cougs down there at UH, and... Waco's own Stephen Simcox of Locked On Horn Frogs covering TCU. Um, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit yesterday. The top three teams in the recruiting rankings right now in the Big 12 for 2025, TCU, UCF, Baylor, are all thinking, we got to fire our coach. We got to move on. We got to get someone else in here, right? And as a Baylor fan, obviously that's not what you want to go through anyway, but that, you know, might be the necessary evil to turn things around. Uh, you know, coaching searches aren't necessarily fun. They're interesting, but it's not a position you want to be in. You want to have a direction for your program. And that's what you're looking for in a coaching search. The, the thing with it, though, is the last two cycles for Baylor, they haven't had a ton of competition in state. Now, when they hired Matt Rule, they, the UT was open. But let's be honest, as much as we hate those guys, it's not the same level. UT can get coaches that won't even that won't even interview at Baylor, right? And so they went and got Tom Herman. Baylor got Matt Rule. Baylor won that one. Um, but if you look at this time around, you could have Baylor and TCU looking for coaches this offseason. That's not good for Baylor and, and probably not great for either school. Uh, but you look at how similar those programs are. And what kind of coach they're looking for, what what they're looking for in a coach, what they're looking for in a recruit, what they're looking for in their program and therefore their university are all very similar. 
and what they can pay is very similar. And the prestige of the job right now is very similar, although probably an upper hand to TCU. They've shown more sustainable winning uh, over the last 25 years, whereas Baylor has shown off and on winning, um, but mostly on for the last 10 or 12 years. Um, that to me, just I, I just don't like adding competition to that. I, I don't like adding someone like TCU or Tech, or even in this case, SMU, adding to the coaching search when we're looking for that. Because I've seen a lot of people talk about Rhett Lashley at, at SMU. I would love Rhett Lashley in here for what he's done with that program. Is that an easy enough sell? SMU is competing for the ACC championship this year. The ACC. Not the AAC. Okay? That makes it all the much more tough for Baylor and for TCU. So... When you're looking at guys like Jeff Trailer and G.J. Kinney, and both those jobs are open, that is going to really jack up the price. You know, it, it is absolutely, it's like, it's like trying to buy something right before the holidays that you could have bought in July. Those prices are going to go up. And when they know that you're desperate and there's leverage to be had, that price is certainly going to go up. Because let's just play it out. Both teams are going looking at G.J. Kinney. Kenny's going to, Kenny's agent's going to tell Baylor, you know, oh, that's a good number. Yeah, but TCU's given us another 2 million and vice versa. And I think that is a dangerous spot for Baylor to be in. And I'm sure for SMU, or excuse me, TCU as well. Sorry, I didn't mean to mistake those for you guys. Um, and I think there's an interesting timeline as they go about this and whether one team decides, hey, we are going to move on from our coach and we're going to do it in the middle of the season to get out ahead of this. I think there's some parallels you can draw to the team that Baylor has next on the schedule that absolutely did that. And it's something I want to get into with some of our tech people next week, but absolutely those, those guys are going to have a higher tax on them, higher interest rate um, because both Baylor and TCU are very similar football head coaching jobs and they might well both be open uh, come December when when Black Monday comes around, it'll actually be December 2nd this year, I believe, will be that Monday. Um, but it, it's an interesting way to look at this. I'm not saying that needs to be the reason why you fire a coach or why you fire a coach early or why you don't fire a coach, but I think that's a very realistic landscape that you're looking at in, in two months here, that both Baylor and TCU are looking for coaches, very similar programs, looking for very similar guys, and with some pretty good in-state options at head coach. Oof, yeah, that is going to really drive up the price. Let me know what you think about that. Is that going to drive up the price? Is one of these programs, Baylor or TCU, much better than the other, a much sexier job to go to right now? Do they have better infrastructures? Because to me, they look very much the same at this point in time. Um, and they would both, you know... Uh, if this goes a couple more years before the Super League, before Project Rudy, both teams could be in the same tier, and it's not tier one. Um, so just, just something to think about. It's something to think about. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about Project Rudy. I'm actually really interested. I want to hear from the college football fan here. Let me know what you think about that, how it benefits college football, how it might benefit Bayor or not benefit Bayor. Get involved in the comments section below. Be sure to like and subscribe. It's a huge help to the channel. We're very near 3,000 subscribers. So every time you hit that like button, ring that notification button, or get your friend to come and, and subscribe because you already subscribed, that's a huge help for me and for this channel and for getting out better content for you guys that covers Baylor every single day, five days a week and most Saturdays, y'all. We're the only place that's doing that exclusively, doing it for free and not partnering with the university. Just saying, putting it out there. I so appreciate you guys for making it your first listen today and every day. It's been an awesome season so far in terms of the numbers and we hope that the Bears can turn it around so it's a fun one to watch and a fun one for the numbers as well. Uh, thank you again for making your first listen today and every day. We'll see you tomorrow on Locked on Baylor.